Oh, right. Do you know it's like sitting in front of the, the, the screen when you've 80 students in front of it and you're not sure if they're there or not. But anyway, thank you for the opportunity. And interestingly, Michael, when you mentioned, um, and Jess referred to it as well, where we make mistakes and the literature is now starting to refer to that as professional embarrassment. But as Fidel and Jess both said, you know, move on, you know, acknowledge it, apologize and, and move on. But it is it is a thing with, with, within there. One of the first things you'll probably notice about the slide, um, and that's the title, um, it isn't particularly inclusive. So I'm going to start again. If my hand would stop shaking and. There we go. And I've changed it to the challenge of inclusive practice in perinatal care. Firstly, because it is obviously more inclusive for the community that use our services. But there is also a, a, ca a caution with that in that, as the word stands, perinatal is around pregnancy. So in some ways, Hal Ardalen also suggests that by using perinatal, we could actually add confusion because it is not actually taking in all of reproductive health care and could potentially restrict then our language just to the pregnancy, labour and postnatal period because those reproductive health issues are not actually accurately captured within that perinatal period. So when I first started to prepare this, I sort of thought, oh my word, what a minefield. It's obviously not a straightforward issue, it's complex. There are a number of layers within it, and it's much more than just merely addressing a person with the correct pronoun for their self-identified gender. As I said, there are many issues, there's layers within the mix, and it can be that bit of a minefield. I'm not saying that we're all penguins, by the way. And it obviously requires sensitive and carefully balanced negotiation within those complexities. So the aim of the presentation this afternoon is not to solve the issues in the time available, but obviously to raise debate and to tentatively propose a sensitive and a compassionate way forward. There have been a significant number of advances and changes in perinatal care provision over the last few decades. And that includes the demographical profile of people that now use our services. Some of these demographical changes have been quite rapid, particularly in comparison to the slow pace of advancing women's rights to equality and women-centred care over the last century. And if I put that into context, when I first commenced my midwifery career, and I'm not going to say when that was, it would have been frowned upon to actually have been um, admit it to the maternity care environment and not have the prefix of Mrs. Single parenthood was not readily accepted within society at that time and those women would have been considered a marginalised group. And to add to that mix at that time, if a woman wanted to have a sterilisation procedure, she actually needed to have her husband's signature on the consent form. So we have certainly come a long way since then with women now having much greater autonomy and single parenthood is no longer shunned, but it's very much accepted now as a norm within society. Having said that though, marginalised groups still exist and they continue to face perceived discrimination within the provision of care that we provide and services available. And obviously there are a number of marginalised communities that utilise perinatal and reproductive health services, but this presentation is going to focus on inclusive language particularly in relation to the trans and um, gender diverse communities within perinatal services. So we no longer practice in an era where only cisgender women will be or want to be pregnant. And as we've moved into the 21st century, certainly those demographic profiles have changed and we have become increasingly gender diverse. And whilst there have been attempts to quantify the numbers, the statistics, these are challenging. Um, the, the available evidence does point to a rapidly increasing trend towards visible pregnancy amongst trans people worldwide. Norris and Berneski recommend 
very much a cultural shift towards recognising and implementing a holistic approach to care provision for our gender diverse population and a move away from that internalised cisnormative narrative that trans and pregnancy are not compatible. Being pregnant does not undermine a trans man's sense of himself as a man and the desire for legal gender recognition and the wish to be pregnant are no longer mutually exclusive. And it is interesting that until relatively recently, some countries actually required proof of sterility as a prerequisite for legal gender recognition. So we certainly have seen advances in that respect as well. And then coming through from UK support and self-help organisations, there are reports of an increasing trend of young trans men now requesting advice around hormone use so that they can become pregnant um, in, their, in their journey. And therefore, as health professionals, we need to be very much adequately prepared to provide holistic person-centred care for everyone utilising our reproductive health services. And that is irrespective of their chosen gender identity and acknowledging that individual needs and preferences are obviously unique and that we provide safe, supportive environments where everyone can feel empowered, respected and in control. And that is key to promoting inclusivity within care. So additionally, we also need to be mindful that treating people as individuals whilst avoiding assumptions and recognising diversity are also key principles of the code published by the ANMC. So as a way, as a, a means of a background, just to sort of set the scene, and it's, it's sort of reiterating some of the points already made. So for centuries, obviously, childbirth has been perceived as the domain of women, both professionally and for those needing, <clears throat> pardon me, or using this reproductive services. And the terminology utilised within reproductive health is very heavily geared towards the cisgender population. And that obviously in turn reflects the global majority of persons using the services. But as I as said previously, as the 21st century has progressed, we're now seeing that increasing number of individuals using our services, but who do not identify as being female. And that is despite their biological anatomy and physiology. And then there are others, obviously, who do not ident identify with, with either gender and self-identify as non-binary. <clears throat> The literature suggests that these groups feel marginalised within reproductive health services and some will go as far as to conceal their gender identity and become invisible to fit in and feel accepted with the heteronormative environment. And that in turn could lead to gender dysphoria, psychological stress, which in turn can lead to a negative impact on the pregnancy as well as the subsequent offspring. So in general, the consequences for marginalised groups are obviously much greater in relation to their vulnerability, uh, isolation, invisibility or erasure and also minority stress. They're more likely to have poor health outcomes both for themselves and for their infants and there's a greater likelihood then of poor he mental health issues. When inclusivity is not transparent, there is that potential for trans erasure or that perceived invisibility and the need for individuals then to make decisions about whether, when and actually how to disclose their gender identity. So thus they need to read the environment, they're looking for an indication of safety, an indication of belonging, acceptance and also trustworthiness. Inclusive, inclusivity therefore needs to be very much transparent to enable that sense of belonging and respect and acceptance for everyone. And that's both for those who work in the service as well as those who use the service. The hand shaking again. So how do we promote inclusivity through inclusive language? Midwives are very, very familiar with the issues of power and power differentials involved in language and that power of language. It has the power and meaning, um, language has power and meaning and can reflect our priorities, our beliefs, our values, as well as our culture. And it's very much central to our individual identity. It can empower whilst at the same time disempower individuals. 
And we know that poor use of language can portray unintended messages and also contribute to socially constructed power dynamics as well as bias. And that can then cause harm to both pregnant women and pregnant people. Poor language hinders the development of therapeutic relations and perpetuates stereotypes. So inclusivity, therefore, recognises the complexities of ourselves as human beings and also that freedom from narrow binary definitions and in doing so promotes justice for all within re reproductive care and birth environments. So inclusive language needs to acknowledge diversity. It needs to be respectful and sensitive and consistent with the preference of individuals as well as communities. We should be encouraging language that avoids exclusion, that is warm, that is welcoming, that avoids assumptions and that places the person first in all that we do. In other words, the individual is referred to by their name and not by, for example, the PPH in Bay 2 when we talk about people first language. By creating a more inclusive healthcare environment, um, it does require an approach that is mindful of the feelings of all individuals and therefore we need to find a balance in language and an approach where everyone feels acknowledged and valued regardless of their gender identity or their biological physiology. I can't get this slide to move on, just bear with me, here we go. Gotcha. So, the recommendations in relation to promoting inclusive language, um, and there are a few good guidelines out there, including, um, I'll refer to Brighton and Sussex guidelines, as well as the digital NHS guidelines. But the recommendations within the available literature suggest several actions that will enhance inclusivity and expand the language that we use to support people who identify differently and help them feel a part of and welcomed by our services. It doesn't need to exclude or alienate cisgender women who, as we know, are the majority users of the service. Um, and they should still feel you know, that, that lived experience, but we need to take that lived experience <clears throat> into consideration. And we also need to take into consideration the lived experience of those from our trans and gender diverse populations when we review and implement inclusive language. By expanding or adding to language that is already in use, it has the aim of providing individualised care for every person and therefore ensure that all women and people can see themselves reflected in the services that they actually use. So if we're thinking about the perinatal and reproductive health department, um, which also then would include gynae services, or pregnant women and people, birthing women and people. Um, but then we're thinking then in relation to that front facing information, how it's written, um, but it can be written in the second person, which in turn could actually be considered a more personalised approach. So when we think about the literature that is available um, on social media, on our, you know, you know our, our trust websites, if we're referring to you rather than woman or man, etc., it, it does have a warmer approach and is more personalised. And by using a more gender additive approach, that expands the use of language to include then gender neutral language. And that sits alongside the language of womanhood and helps to ensure that everyone is represented and included. And we know language is dynamic and we are aware that it can change obviously at a rapid pace. Therefore, we also need to be aware and to the changing terminology and sensitive to that change in terminology and expressions and very much listen to the users of the service to ensure that there is continual acceptability and acceptance for the language that we're using. One of the cautions within the literature is to remember that language changes actually shouldn't apply when we're working on a one to one basis with individuals. Um, we should actually refer to their self identified gender. Um, and documentation, docu documentation would obviously be the same when we're thinking about maternity handheld notes, for example. They should reflect the gender identity of that individual. And evidently, when caring for cis women, it's good practice to use terminology that is meaningful and appropriate to that individual. So if we're thinking about cisgender, we're thinking about woman, mother, breastfeeding. Whereas if we're thinking about trans man, 
we would obviously use that in a different way and possibly refer to chest feeding, for example. Um, and we also need to be aware that the term women or women encompasses both cisgender as well as co-parents or trans women, and therefore it has that bearing, so keeping that in mind. But co-parents, for example, may not uh, identify with that terminology, and therefore um, they could have literally any of the gender identities and therefore may identify with cis or trans, non-binary and or intersex. The other aspect, um, and this is, I think, where some of that professional embarrassment comes in, is when we think about using chosen names or pronouns and affirming that uh, gender. We can we can use that. Uh, we use the, we are encouraged to use that within our emails at the moment. Um, are thinking about um, obviously when we're writing up notes, um, and that obviously helps to create a more friendly and accommodating environment. And it also demonstrates if we are all using and indicating what our pronouns or preferred pronouns are, it also displays a degree of allyship then to the trans and gender diverse community. Um, and it also in turn encourages gender diverse people then to seek health care. There is the recommendation that health practitioners have obviously a sufficient regard for cultural competence. And cultural competence, obviously, it's, it's a very broad format. It's not just about being aware of our the trans and gender populations. It's, it's, it's broader than that. But if we do have that awareness um, and competence within our knowledge of varying cultures, then it fosters better communication, trust, as well as overall health outcomes. And it is an essential aspect of providing equitable, safe, person-centred as well as responsive health care. A frequently indicated issue or barrier to promoting inclusivity and inclusive language is that lack of awareness of the needs of the gender diverse community, particularly amongst health practitioners, which has also been referred to already um, within the previous presentations. And it highlights the need then for that continued professional development, as well as building that foundation of knowledge and understanding within our undergraduate curricula. To sustain inclusive, inclusivity requires a cultural and a societal shift with a, a willingness of health practitioners to take responsibility as well as accountability for their ongoing awareness and development of their cultural competence. The transgender um, diverse community shouldn't actually need to educate their health practitioners. Again, that's a point that has already been raised. But we should also use their experience to learn. We should listen and learn from their experiences and how we then can continue to improve our service provision. In some cases, it may mean going back to basics and differentiating between sex, gender, sexual orientation. But we should also be mindful that a you know, we do have to have that knowledge and understanding of sex in relation to physiology to provide safe and effective care. So the other aspect that can be challenging is having an awareness of implicit bias. It's obviously vital to enhancing cultural competence, but it's not always a comfortable experience, particularly if we realise that we do have a, a normative blind spot. And that could be either personally or from a professional perspective. So identifying implicit bias within ourselves can be enhanced actually through thinking about reflective practice and reflecting on our actions on a regular basis. And that is something obviously that is encouraged very much now within the undergraduate prefer our undergraduate curricula and within their clinical practice. Avoiding assumptions that may sound, you know, like common sense, but it's actually amazing how many assumptions are made about gender identity with the result then of misgendering. And that can be particularly relevant when there is a visible pregnancy um, for those individuals, and quite often they are misgendered within our current care systems. The other aspect in relation to cultural practice is encouraging that you know, the ethos that change can be positive for everybody. It is challenging, um, but it obviously can be positive. And the more inclusive 
that we are within our practice, the more responsive we will be for those marginalised groups and everyone who uses perinatal and reproductive health care services. And that's also reiterated within feminist writing. For example, Laura Godfrey Isaacs has indicated that she sees it as actually a feminist movement in relation to promoting more inclusiveness within language and within our community, our, our perinatal provision. I've just, the next slide actually, I'm going to just very quickly run through um, some of the models of care that would enhance inclusivity. If we think about person-centred care, that, that should be an ethos of everyone's practice. And the argument is that if all care is person-centred, then inclusive language, you know, that, that should then be the norm for, well, for at least the individual, but it won't necessarily address the need for inclusivity within you know, the information that is front facing for the public. And a very good example of um, an, an indication of good practice and an exemplar in relation to um, in, enhancing inclusive language within care is that provided by the Brighton and Sussex University Health Hospitals. And they have led the way in pioneering the first published guidelines for inclusive language and perinatal services. They also have created midwife roles specialising in gender inclusiveness, although such a role would be obviously be dependent on a community profile and assessing the needs of within the Pacific Trust and as to whether or not obviously that would be economically viable. But the one model that I feel that meets literally all of the requirements and would have really good outcomes for the marginalised groups is the continuity of midwifery care. It's a model that's well established. It has a significant evidence base that demonstrates really good health outcomes, both psychologically and physically, and it's recognised as being particularly valuable for vulnerable and marginalised groups. And obviously within that, the development of therapeutic relations within a one on a one to one or within a small team of mid midwives has great potential to overcome some of the challenges that marginalised groups have experienced. Um, and that have been documented as being experienced. I mean, you could obviously go into more models of care, and I suppose in some ways Brighton and Sussex, it's not necessarily a model of care, but thinking about the advent of having gender inclusive midwifery roles um, and how that could change expectations, particularly if you're living in a, an urban area where there, there is, you know, the demographic profile indicates that that would be of value. In summary, you know, um, what has already been indicated by the, the presenters to date is actually uh, reflected in this presentation. There is evidence, obviously, that trans and gender diverse people are very much a marginalised group within perinatal services. Um, one of the difficulties is our method of data collection. I think I've just jumped a slide. Sorry. I've just realised that. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Let me go back to challenges. <laughs> and you will be aware of the challenges, um, as well as the challenges that have already been just highlighted quite a number of challenges, one of which that I hadn't actually considered was safety in relation to language and ensuring that we protect the individual who's maybe not ready to come out um, and indicate their, their self-identity. Societal norms, obviously, is, is one of our bigger challenges and difficult to change. Um, they will take time. And that's because, obviously, for, for centuries, the global majority of people who utilise perinatal services have been female or cisgender. So they're going to take time to change. And that's despite that increasing, that increasing trend towards more visible pregnancies amongst the trans and gender diverse community. A further challenge and I think it's probably one of the bigger challenges as well is infrastructure. Our IT systems do not easily differentiate between gender and biological sex um, and that, that creates a significant number of loopholes for the trans non-binary person to navigate within the organisational layers of the NHS and legal systems. One prime example of that is where uh, in relation to registration of birth in one such case, a trans man was denied legal recognition as a father on his child's birth certificate because by law, 
he was a mother because he had given birth and the biological fact of pregnancy and birthing then were leveraged to discredit his gender identity. And that in turn continues to promote cis normative social and also legal preconceptions. So we do require an indication on, to support that in relation to accurate data. There are actually very few countries that da collect, collate data on gender identity and the emergency, the emerging trend of pregnancy in the trans population. Australia is, is one exception uh, where gender identity is collated through Medicare. And between the years of 2013 and 2020, for example, they had 246 trans men who were recorded as giving birth. So that's obviously adding to our evidence base. But there does remain the potential argument that available data will still be underestimated until there is a more inclusive environment and the gender diverse communities feel comfortable and safe to disclose and affirm, affirm their, their gender status. So, I mean, the, by no means these that these are the only challenges. There are many more hidden challenges under the surface and not necessarily exclusive to the perinatal services. We think about other reproductive health services, which Jess also alluded to, thinking about cervical screening and contraceptive services. And as we listen to the voices of the marginalised groups, I'm sure other challenges and further challenges will also be identified as we move forward. So going back to the summary. Um, yeah, a marginalized, very much a marginalised group amongst other marginalised groups. And the available data suggests that this increasing trend of pregnancy amongst the transgender community is going to continue and if, if anything, it will increase. Um, and to enable them that effective care within a trustworthy environment requires health practitioners to take accountability and responsibility to become more knowledgeable and understanding to enable, as I said, effective, safe and welcoming care environments. So promoting inclusivity with in perinatal services is it's obviously multifaceted and requires very careful consideration. As I've indicated, there are many layers to address, not just about the one to one conversations, the ind individual record keeping, but thinking about the front facing information uh, that the public reads. And that obviously then incorporates the structural and the organisational as well as the professional. And it obviously in evidence, um, again, Jess referred to this co-production. We need to be thinking about working together with those voices um, and gathering that information that the research and um, the evidence that will help us move forward in a cohesive manner and that, that ensures inclusiveness. This slide is just pointing out some of the links that I find useful and beneficial. Um, I've also included the link there to the Brighton and Sussex Inclusivity Guidelines, which, as I mentioned earlier, were the first to be published in the UK. And interestingly, they actually faced a backlash at that time as well. Um, there are evidently there's a, there's a number of guidelines and examples of change towards inclusive language out there. Several several of our known organisations that are relevant to our professional practice have made that move to be more inclusive with their language and their front facing um, information. And that includes the World Health Organisation, the, the Royal College of Nursing, Royal College of Midwives, GMC, as well as UNICEF. Um, and I haven't obviously included the links for all of those, but they are very, very easily accessible. Um, and this this sort of penultimate slide um, is just I've included it sort of to, yeah, create some thought in relation to how we move forward and encourage ourselves to be more empathetic and courageous as we do move towards creating a more inclusive world about us. And finally, as a point, uh, well, actually, it's a little bit of my, I have this thing about numbers. So unfortunately, I can't finish on an odd number. So I am going to include a reflection slide, which brings me up to my even numbers again. Um, so in finishing up, um, I want to leave you with two questions to reflect upon. And as I certainly know from in the preparation for this pre presentation, I, it gave me many moments where I pause to consider my own practice and the language that I use in everyday conversations, which is possibly why Frida didn't get the presentation until last night. 
Um, and you may you may be thinking that transgender and you know diverse the gender diverse community people you know are a minority group and therefore it won't affect you or your practice. However, consider that some will and have concealed their gender identity in order to fit in with this, this normative environment. Might you already actually have already provided care for that individual? And if so, how did you make them feel? So when we think about implicit bias, as I mentioned previously, it, we don't always feel comfortable acknowledging that we may have an implicit bias or a blind spot. But by addressing that discomfort, that has the potential to enhance our care delivery and interaction with others. So if we if we think about even just the, our language when conversing with others, and do we actually make assumptions about gender? And then the second point is just take a moment to walk in the shoes of another. You know, if we belong to and if if we belong to a marginalised group, um, or a group outside of our own uh, gender identity. Would we feel welcomed? Would we experience that sense of belonging, either in the place your place of work or practice, or you know, if if you're using services, for example? And I'll leave you with that point to ponder over lunch. Spot, That's me. spot on there, Gail. Thank you very, very much. Again, my my takeaway point that you made, Gail, as an educator was about how we can learn from people's lived experience, not relying upon that yeah. as their responsibility to educate everybody. That's our job as educators. But I think we can definitely learn from them. So we get lots of hand claps there, Gail. I um, also noticed in the chat that Beth had popped in on the 18th of June. They're holding an event and there's a link into it if anybody wants to register and join that. So that brings us spot on time to lunch. We've set aside.